So how do you feel, Georgia, after managing? Centropic agriculture. Um, it's different, definitely. It's very different from, so I'm part of a food sovereignty project back in Scotland. And uh, there we don't chop down massive banana trees and like one after the other with this really sticky liquid and use a massive machete. I don't, I don't feel like using massive machetes would be considered health and safety mm -hmm. in Scotland. So yeah. And what you are seeing here, is it agroecology for you? Is it something that we can call agroecology? My definition of agroecology is basically you're farming within the context of ecology. So rather than trying to farm against nature, you're farming with nature. And I think this is what they're trying to do here, definitely. In fact, here they put their entire trust in farming with nature, completely. And it's very different because what I'm used to is you farm this way because it generates that kind of output and you try and compartmentalize all the different aspects of farming. Whereas here, they're just trying to mimic a natural ecosystem and they don't necessarily always question it. They just go with it. Mm. And do you think this mindset could be adapted to France? To France? To Europe. Because ah, France is different, I think. To Europe. <laughs> Europe. Like the... Cla the European people ha have the same relation to forests and nature and they could trust like this forest? Yeah, I think they have the same relationship, absolutely. I think it's whether or not it's possible to convince farmers to farm like this. And I think a lot of that comes down to not only land reform, but young new farmers coming in with new ideas. And I think that's a big issue in Europe at the moment, particularly in Scotland is how do we reform land ownership so that young people who, or anyone actually, who goes around the world, they see these different types of projects or they're just inspired by something they see on the internet or a video like this and they want to try and grow a connection with the earth and they want to try and farm their own food. So how do we give people access to land so that they can try these kind of new ideas So it's not just convincing conventional farmers or even large-scale organic farmers to try some of these techniques, but also allowing innovators to come into the field of agriculture and creating a framework where people can experiment without the huge losses that comes with risk and the huge benefits, but the potential huge losses that can come if you experiment as a farmer. And what you are doing here in Brazil, your, your project, do you think it will help uh, farmers from Brazil and maybe other countries to be convinced that agroecology is uh, something in, for the future? Yeah, the company I was working for while I was here on the project was a company called Hizoma, Rhizoma. And um, it was based at Fazenda da Toca. They have another farm as well, about two hours away in Sao Paulo State. Um, and basically, they are trying to prove that you can upscale regenerative agriculture. So what you've got around me is amazing. And it's again, it's people coming in and just getting some land and going with it. But how do we convince the large scale farmers that already own a lot of the land or their tenant farmers and the point for Rizoma is that they're trying to show that okay actually this works on a large scale we can still regenerate the environment and farm large scale using various different methods and now Rizoma was doing agroforestry silvopasture and organic grains as well and those were their their three big things and I came in from Wageningen in the Netherlands Wageningen University uh, to develop a soil sampling protocol for them which they can use to measure whether their their practices are actually regenerative and that's really important because it's hard to convince people it's hard to convince the unconvinced unless you have some sort of evidence to show them that actually it's working because it's trying to bridge the divide between the 
the altruists, the people who and the people who really care about permaculture and agroforestry and syntropic agriculture and the people who are more large scale, maybe confined a little bit more uh, by large debts, already invested a lot in machinery and land. How do we convince them to start making their practices a bit more regenerative? And so the protocol was there to measure how well Rizoma's techniques, for example, develop a habitat for soil biodiversity? How do they help with water regulation? And just by having a few key indicators that you can measure, you can already start to say a lot. So things like organic matter content, um, also the available water in the soil, the infiltration capacity. And then you can take that data and you can prove how well the techniques are working on the farm to provide these ecosystem services. And f if I'm a farmer from Brazil and I want to check the regeneration of my soil because I'm doing agroforestry, for mm -hmm. example, what, what, which keys can I use? So for Hizoma, they had three key uh, soil functions, as we call it. Carbon, water and biodiversity. Now carbon, they were linking with a local NGO that does carbon accounting called Ima Flora. And I was focusing on water and biodiversity for them. And for water, it was measuring the available water capacity in the soil and infiltration capacity. Now, infiltration capacity is something you can, you can measure relatively easily. All you need is a metal pipe and a hammer, and you just pound it into the soil and you measure how long it takes water to run through the pipe. And then for biodiversity, that one's a bit more tricky. It's what do you want to get from your system? So for example, if you want to see how close your system is to a natural ecosystem, you might want to measure the bacterial biomass to fungal biomass ratio. Because depending on what ecosystem you have, whether it's a, a monoculture of soy or it's a natural forest, the balance between bacteria and fungi in your ecosystem will differ. So if you're trying to make your farming system a little bit more like a natural ecosystem, you'd measure fungal to bacterial ratio. If you want to see how stable your system is, you could also measure uh, nematode abundance and diversity as well. If you're wanting to measure the stability of your system and you want to see what techniques are increasing your good nematodes and which ones are increasing your bad nematodes that reduce your yield, you want to measure your nematode abundance and diversity as well. However, fungal to bacterial ratio and nematode abundance and diversity are both very important measures, but you kind of need to be able to link with a research institute or a lab, which can be kind of cheap, actually. There's a lot of programs around the world where you just grab some soil from the ground, you put it in a bag, you put it in an envelope and you send it by post, and it's very easy to do to a local lab. The really easy thing to communicate and for you to see as a farmer yourself really well is earthworm abundance and diversity. And again, that's really quite easy. I'm happy if you want to contact me to tell you how, but you can, basically you dig some soil out of the ground, you pop it on a plastic sheet, and you just see how many earthworms you have in that lump of soil. And also like whether they're young or whether they're old and the different kind of species they are. So which functional groups? Because earthworms are absolutely essential for our soil <laughs> and, um, also, you can only you can just look at the functional groups, the feeding groups. So are they the type of earthworm that grabs organic matter and buries it deep into the ground? Or are they, are they the ones that stay on the surface and they just go along like that, dragging it through? So earthworms are, are known as the engineers of the soil, and that's for good reason. Mm -hmm. There's also a huge problem with lack of earthworms in modern agriculture. So the protocol that I designed um, well, designed working with uh, the, the Landmark project, which is a European Union project, actually, um, based also in Wageningen. As I said, I designed this specifically for Hizoma's needs. And every farmer will have something they want to focus on, something that's more of a challenge in their land and their soil. So for Hizoma, it was all focusing on water, biodiversity and carbon as well. And all together, it was about nine indicators. Now there is a lot of options out there. 
You've got the Cornell Soil Health Test as well. In the UK, you have the Sector Mentor Test. Actually, there's a lot of different institutes that provide all the details you can use to measure your soil. And they also provide the facilities for you to actually have the soil analyzed. So the only thing you have to do is follow the instructions, get your soil, put it in a bag, send it in the mail to them, and then they'll help you decipher what it actually means and how you can make things, how you can improve on things as well. And the project that I'm coming from is a really large scale project. And it's a European research project called the Landmark Project. And it was designed by research institutions and universities over the entirety of the European Union. So it works in multiple climates and multiple systems. So I definitely recommend looking up the Landmark Project as well, because that's working on a, a larger scale. And that's really it. So I think the important thing is what kind of matters for you and just start measuring your soil. Because the first step in agroecology is understanding your ecosystem. So you have to learn how it works, basically. And that's it. And can you say earthworm in all the language you know? <laughs> I can just say it in one. <laughs> earthworm and uh, ver uh, vergiterum. <laughs>